hey, I can pop in here and say hi. Um, even wearing red, the proud color of the monarchs <laughs> in school mode. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, behind me is a picture of Laguna Beach that I filmed before the beaches were closed, not like I'm there right now or shot this recently. But last night um, I did get to go out on a, a yacht and see the uh, bioluminescence of the ocean. So that was really cool. Uh, we went out uh, a couple miles uh, in the dark um, and you could see the water just glowing in the waves and in the in the wake of the yacht. It was really cool. So um, hope that you're getting some sunshine and staying healthy and all that. And we are going to talk about explosives today. And in the last class, we went over the uh, forensic investigation of arson and fire investigations. So we're kind of still in that same theme of uh, destruction on a large scale. So these types of crimes uh, carry high penalties because of the nature of the weapon that is used. And it's uh, like a weapon of mass destruction it can do a lot of damage to property and to large groups of people. So we are going to uh, go over these notes here so you can follow along. So um, the explosives are measured in, in, in regards to the fuel that is used. Some really uh, goes up quickly. It seems like they all go quick because they're explosives, but there is a low explosive and a high explosive. So those are the designations. Uh, it's based on the velocity of the detonation, like if it's less than a thousand meters per second, that's a low velocity. If it goes above that, it's high velocity. And what an explosion is, it is an uncontrolled uh, chemical uh, equation or reaction. So it's a rapid oxidation reaction and it produces a pressure wave. So if it's a low explosive, it's a low pressure wave. And if it's a high explosive, it's a high pressure wave. And, and like in the movies, the, those sh uh, shock waves can uh, disrupt surroundings. It can knock people over, um, but it's the resulting flames from the explosion that is also going to continue to cause damage. So, uh, this rapid deflagration, that term is a Latin term. It just uh, refers to the combustion and its heat transfer. And so it, it moves uh, the heat through the material to the, you know, from the hot to the cold area. And um, detonation, it's, it's a supersonic. Uh, but deflagration, it's subsonic. So there are differences in terminology and stuff when you get down to it. So explosive substances, uh, let me follow along with your notes to make sure I'm not going too fast through a spot where you have to write things down. So you've got things to write down on this slide right here. It's uh, the first paragraph, a rapid oxidation reaction. That's what an explosion is. It involves oxygen. So in the atmosphere, it's about 16% of the gas in the atmosphere. And uh, it's part of why things rust. And it's what is needed for fire. We went over the fire triangle the other day. You have to have a heat source. You have to have fuel and you have to have oxygen. Uh, so that is an explosion requiring oxygen. And it's a sudden buildup of gas pressure that constitutes the explosion, either high or low explosion. And the gale forced uh, winds can be 7,000 miles an hour uh, from the rapid oxidation buildup of gas and the ignition of the gas. And it's the speed at which 
the decomposition of the material, it's going to be high or low explosives as we defined it on the last slide. All right, the most widely used explosive is black powder and smokeless powder, like you see in this picture right here. Uh, these were the fuel source, you know, for the old muskets, and it is what is packed inside of shell casings. And it is a mixture of a few things, as you see on the slide here, potassium, sodium nitrate, charcoal, sulfur, and smokeless powder is just as its name implies, it doesn't produce any smoke. It's got uh, some nitrocellulose, which it's uh, nitrogen and cellulose is a carbohydrate that comes from plants. So it involves cotton, which is a plant product. And, or it could be uh, man-made stuff, nitroglycerin. Um, so it's a mixture of those two things to make it smokeless. A common low explosive, uh, it's that black powder, and it is used with safety fuses. So uh, in order to light off an explosion, they have a primer, which is a low explosive. It's not sensitive to shock and and sudden um, ignition, things like that. Uh, so it's easy to work with. That's why it's called a safety. And it's used as the fuses to light off the high explosives. So pipe bombs are something that you are going to be looking at with the Boston bombing. They, they made homemade bombs with things that you could buy over at Home Depot. Um, and isn't that also what you saw with Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing? He got a lot of materials right there from the home and garden. If you look at what fertilizer is, it is nitrogen. And you recall on the previous slide how it, it needs to have a nitrogen in the explosion uh, material. And, and so this is what they typically will put in pipe bombs, things that are easy to get. And the fuel source is the carbon and the nitrogen. They will pack it with starch, uh, magne magnesium fillings, um, shards of nails and things like that. And it is just, with a plastic or a metal pipe with caps on the end, and then they put a fuse in there. And this is something that you never want to joke around with. You don't want to play a prank with a pipe that doesn't have the pipe bomb inside, but if it looks like a pipe bomb, uh, it is going to be treated just like it is a real bomb. And uh, it's a serious offense to to play with uh, fire and to accidentally or intentionally burn things down or to do that with a pipe bomb, with a bomb of any nature, or even with uh, like make-believe. So it is very serious business. We're still on low explosives. Kind of a repeat slide here. Low explosives could also be uh, natural gas. And uh, yes, it does require mixture in air because oxygen is needed. And now on to high explosives. And here you have a fill in the blank on detonation. Uh, high explosives detonate very quickly. The extremely rapid oxidation. Um, it is accompanied by a more violent disruptive shock wave, more disruption and damage due to buildings. It's greater than 1,000 meters per second. And uh, that would be 
like a football field in one second. Um, so it's highly disruptive. Among the high explosives, um, primarily uh, these explosives are ultra sensitive to heat, shock, friction. Um, so when people are, are making homemade bombs, uh, typically uh, they're novices and they can just blow themselves up. And it is sensitive to um, the slightest shock, uh, sweat hitting the high explosives might be enough to ignite the high explosives. So secondary explosives are relatively insensitive to heat, shock, and friction. So secondary explosives are in small quantities to detonate the high explosives. So that's how that works. Since they're ultra sensitive to heat, shock, and friction, they are typically handled with the utmost of care in case they're having to remove like a pipe bomb from this trash receptacle. And they're gonna be in gear if, if they're gonna have a person grab it. They might just use a robot to go over there, grab it, put it into a safe detonation chamber, and then just explode it right there. But uh, if a person has to be involved, then they're definitely going to be in a bomb suit. So as we mentioned, the secondary high explosive is used to detonate the main high explosive. So this is the relatively insensitive to heat, shock, and friction. It's really gonna burn rather than detonate and it is more safe to, to deal with. Um, secondary high explosives um, are used commercially. They're used to blast away rocks to build roads, maybe to get a site ready for construction. And we've heard of dynamite, TNT, PETN, RDX, um, and they go by their chemical names, and then oftentimes they are abbreviated, and they're just called by certain letters inside the chemical name itself. Cyclotrimethylene trinitramine, RDX, that's what that is. So um, high explosives, uh, as we mentioned, uh, those are the common ones, uh, dynamite, TNT, PTN, RDX, and uh, you're seeing like underwear here. This is where people would have a, a high explosive and they would have it in their clothes. And this is how they were getting these things into airplanes, for example, in their shoes and their clothes. And um, we're gonna see other pictures where they may even take parts of it and assemble the different explosive materials on board the plane. So uh, more on that coming up on a future slide. Dynamite and TNT, um, they're synonymous, but they're different. Dynamite is more uh, natural. It, it is used with like clay and sawdust and wood pulp. Uh, so all of these things can get wet and then it doesn't work very well. But TNT on the other hand, it's waterproof. And it contains a little bit more energy. I'm not going to test you on the amount of energy and how it's measured in joules, which is what physics uses to uh, measure energy. Um, every energy unit is really convertible to another unit, like uh, a watt and a joule and a newton 
all these are are names for units of measure for categorizing explosives and also for fires they can measure the amount of energy that was in a, a fire we talked about the uh, laboratory that is over on the east coast i think it's in baltimore and it is um, about a three-story high warehouse where they can build out buildings burn them explode them to show what actually happened if they're going to take things to court they want to make sure that they are laying out the facts that are important to the case and so they will duplicate this if they need to at this laboratory so moving on PETN You have to write down uh, that it's a powerful high explosive. You can measure how much energy is in this one compared to the other. Uh, it's got a relative effectiveness factor to it. Uh, it really does get technical. Um, so this is what it was used in some pretty famous cases. Uh, somewhat recent, you know, this is your lifetime, 2009, there was a a uh, airplane bomb on, on Christmas. Someone was trying to get explosives on board. Uh, the 2010 cargo plane. In uh, 2001, someone was bringing this explosive in their shoe, going through the security. Uh, they allowed people to have their shoes on, and so it just looked like part of the shoe itself. This is why you have to take your shoes off now. Uh, because they get they get x-rayed and they can see if there's a compartment in the shoe. RDX stands for Research Department Explosive and it is a military type explosion and a lot of these started in the military and now there are industrial or commercial applications for the explosions. And uh, this was pretty common in World War II. So more powerful than TNT that the government was using originally. And uh, RDX is also known as C4. So they can plasticize this stuff. You've seen it on TV where they can mold it like clay around uh, a safe or a lock and uh, get the energy going in a certain direction for the explosion. RDX is the most popular and powerful, the military explosions. And uh, they, they go by uh, many different names. We're, we will have a quiz on this unit for fire and explosions. So you'll be able to go back to these slides and get the particulars instead of memorizing it, obviously. So secondary explosives have to be detonated by a primary explosive. The primary is going to be the one that is safe to handle. The, the, uh, the secondary explosives are sensitive and the primaries are not. So another type of plastic is ANFO. And these are not going to be affected by water. So they could be used for military applications and not worry about the weather. Here's a picture of a pipe bomb. So if you are dealing with a, a crime scene that is as a result of an explosion, just like you saw with the Oklahoma City bombing, now the crime scene becomes several blocks, not, not just that building, but surrounding building. 
you might not uh, realize it, but they will try to collect every piece of rubble and it might take them months or as in the case of like 9-11, it took a couple of years to get through that entire crime scene. And they take all the parts and they'll put it into like a huge field and warehouse and they will try to piece things back together again. If this pipe bomb went off, a lot of it will be in small shards, but they'll be able to see whether or not they fit together like a puzzle piece. They'll find the wires, they'll find pieces of the electronics. And in many cases, these are enough clues for them to find out where did this come from? Then they start finding where would someone buy it? And then they start going to those stores and getting the sales records. Uh, so they will be able to find this phone, uh, this Nokia phone. They may even be able to get fingerprints off of it. But, uh, you know, some people think that the explosion is going to result in shattered evidence, burnt evidence, but it doesn't all uh, get destroyed. TATP, I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide. Uh, this is a homemade explosive that, that's been used by terrorist organizations. Uh, they strap it to themselves. They try to sneak it on trains and planes. And it's, it's uh, easy to get acetone and uh, hydrogen peroxide. And so this is why we now have like three ounce limit when you're taking a liquid on board. You can't bring much with you because these are clear liquids, acetone and peroxide, and they could be used to assemble a weapon of mass destruction on the plane. So here's a picture. He's got explosive powder strapped to his leg. The uh, syringe is going to contain the liquid chemicals and then uh, they combine it right there and yep, he's gonna blow his leg off, but these guys are suicide bombers and they wanna take the entire plane down for their organization. Their terrorist organization usually wants to claim responsibility for this because then among other terrorists, they get respect. And it's just like the cartels down in Mexico. They want to be the most, most ruthless. They want to be the most feared. And then they kind of get respect and uh, start to rule by fear and get more people to their cause. And, and, and uh, so the reason why you have to take your shoes off and can't take certain amounts of liquid, it's because of these things here. So they do a systematic search they will find the traces of the fuel. It doesn't all get used up. Anything foreign to the site is gonna be collected and analyzed. They sift through everything uh, with metal uh, like screens, large to small, and they will uh, find what they're looking for. It's gonna take a long time, but they will find uh, the materials. There is also uh, machines that can detect the full range of explosives. So ion mobility spectrometers, these are confirmation tests, uh, have to be followed up, but these are quick. It's almost like when we were talking with drugs, there's a, there's a preliminary test and then there's uh, can be followed up in the lab with a confirmation test. So this is something they can use in the field. preliminary identification. So uh, we can move on here. Here's the uh, GCMS. Uh, no, this is the ion mobility spectrometer. Still, uh, it looks like the GCMS, but uh, this is, and this is a couple of years old, so it's getting smaller and smaller and it's still mobile. This is for screening purposes at the airport and in the field. C 
see if you got that ion mobility spectrometer. And then uh, you've got uh, a few things to do here. I hope my, my computer does not die. Um, I've only got a little bit of power left. So if I lose you, then you can catch the rest on uh, recording. So um, collection and analysis preliminary, it's with the IMS. And uh, they, they uh, the GCMS, they, they uh, separate components and the small ones go faster and the heavier molecules lag behind. So it just deals with the physical and chemical properties of what they're dealing with and they can separate it, quantify it. And uh, so in order to do that, they want to maintain the gases. So they, if they're dealing with a crime scene, they seal things in an airtight container label it, then they can get the gas out with a syringe, run it through the machine. Debris and articles are collected uh, from different areas and they're gonna be packaged and separate. So they want to make sure that they categorize, take notes, pictures, and ID everything, date, time, location, person that collected it. And, and so this is a crime scene. This is going to, have to be done scientifically. And uh, some explosives, like you know, it, you have to have certain containers at your house for certain stuff because some chemicals can pass right through plastic. So back at the lab, they're going to examine this um, under a microscope for any unconsumed explosive uh, particles. They'll, they'll be able to, it doesn't all go up, they, they just have to find it. Uh, they're gonna look at the debris that they recovered and they're gonna rinse it um, with certain solvents to get at what they would like to analyze. Uh, they have color spot tests, just like with our drug analysis. This is just kind of a repeat. Uh, thin layer chromatography, gas, chromatography mass spectrometer, that's called a GCMS for short. That's the main confirmation machine, the GCMS. Everything uh, really before that, it's a preliminary, but at the uh, lab end, they're gonna confirm it with the GCMS. The confirmation test is right here with the GCMS. You see pictures of different size atoms and molecules, and the GCMS can separate them up by size. It is going to have the fast, small ones come out of the machine first. They'll identify it and quantify it. And uh, part of the machine is going to have an infrared spect spectrophotometer or X-ray diffraction. So these are other confirmation tests. Infrared spectrophotometer and the x ray diffraction. So, the x ray diffraction, it is applied to solid crystalline things. They can actually get x rays and it gets a um, picture of, of the crystal. As the x ray penetrates the crystal, a portion of the beam is going to get bounced off of it and then go back to the detector. And you know, that's how it works for x-rays. And if, if the uh, beam of x-ray is reflected, it is going to show the crystalline structure and the plane of the, the crystal. And Let's see, I may have lost you for a second, so resume the share. Picture of the x-ray. Every component is known to produce its own unique diffraction pattern. And this is like a fingerprint of a chemical. And it is very um, physical property nature of 
atoms and their molecules. So it is foolproof. Um, this is the fingerprinting of the crystal structure. This is really interesting. It's not really in use because it's too easy to fake, but they can put color-coded chips in the explosion. So when it goes off, they can read it with a detector. It will say that it's like made in the US or other countries. Um, the US uh, does not do this to their weapons. And it's just something that, that they have the capability of doing it, putting a tag in it, but it's uh, only used by Switzerland and uh, just worth noting. The ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms is the, uh, the unit that will be in charge of uh, forensic analysis dealing with fire and explosions. So that's the firearm part of it and they deal with the ex explosion. Um, you can check out uh, they have a database here. It's called the BATS the, it, for arson and uh, ballistics. They have a tracking system. So that's what the BATS mean. And it's, it's a database that they put info from the cases that they work in case something similar shows up other places. They're able to determine uh, maybe a commonality and find someone doing this multiple times. So that's it for our notes, and you can be sure to turn those in when you finish it, because that is a graded assignment.